Hello and welcome back to another episode on the channel. I'm Dr. Nasser here today with you to discuss 15 critical conditions. Very good for residents, hospitalists, anybody who works on the wars. These are emergencies that can happen as you're seeing the patients day in and out. Your patient was stable at 8 p.m. and by midnight they're coding. What happened? The mission is to master those early warning signs. Sepsis and septic shock can happen pretty fast. You know, hypertension is too late. Already you're behind. So early antibiotics, remember, are the most important within one hour. Each hour delayed increases mortality by 7.6%. Of course, we have ways that we can look for sepsis. But remember, if you're getting to that point where the patient is already hypotensive, you're behind. So a lot of times it's best to start empiric and then narrow down. You have a Q so far that's greater than or equal to 2. You have sepsis 3, which is infection plus organ dysfunction. Uh, you want to be early on the antibiotics. The next thing is pulmonary embolism, unexplained tachycardia, tachypnea. You could use your wealth score for risk of stratification. You can look at the PERC rule for lower speed. If you are good with your bedside echoes and ultrasounds, you can take a look at the RV strain. Don't delay the anticoagulation in high probably unstable patients. If patient has a really high well score, patient acutely changed, you have risk factors that can tell you, for example, the patient had surgery, hip surgery, or femur fracture, or something that would really tell you that this is a high likelihood that this could be a PE, just go ahead and start the hip and drip. Don't wait. CTA is the gold standard, but treat them first. Acute coronary syndrome, you could have silent MIs, especially in diabetics. With a neuropathy, they can have a typical chest pain or no chest pain at all. They can just have nausea, fatigue, and dyspnea. Women can have jaw pain, epigastric discomfort. Nurses can call you, tell you, hey, the patient is experiencing pain. The first thing I would ask is, what is this and how did it happen? When did it start? Especially in high-risk patients, you want to be on top of this. So the high-sensitivity troponins, you could do the 0-1-hour protocol, put those on. Not only the troponin series, but also the serial ECGs are very important to capture. So, you know, time is muscle. Remember, door to balloon, less than 90 minutes for STEMIs and immediate dual antiplatelets for N-STEMI. Upper GIBD variceal bleed. This is a patient, you know, they can happen on the floor. Patient starts, you know, vomiting. They have end-stage cirrhosis or liver disease and they have variceal, you know, bleed. It can rapidly become hypotensive. I've had a case of this when patient projectile vomits blood. You need to be ready to transfuse these patients really fast, put a central line in and get started. Make sure you don't over state, of course. Remember, you can use octerotide and start them on prophylactic antibiotics. You need to be ready for an emergent EGD with banding within the first 12 hours. Some hospitals have the massive transfusion protocol that can activate for your unstable patients. Reverse the coagulopathy if this patient is on blood thinner and they're bleeding. Don't forget, you can always reverse your coagulopathies you can always transfuse these patients, not only with blood, but with FAP, PCC things, factors that can help you get to this patient fast. You can give a gas. Again, remember, these are not medical advice. Of course, this is just educational video, but these are some of the things we think about. And we use your own judgment based on your own medical license. Tumor lysis syndrome, we have this presentation, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperuricemia. If you have a med surge with oncology floor in your hospital, you want to think about patients who just started on chemotherapy. They have especially high-risk patients would be the bulky lymphomas, the high tumor burdens, leukemias. One of the things you can look at is when you times your calcium by your phosphate product, if it's greater than 60, think about in this patient needing dialysis because you probably won't be able to get to them fast enough with a sevelomere. Refractory hyperkalemia, volume overload, those are the things you need to be looking for. Now, raspyocrease is contraindicated in G6PD. If, if you're planning to use that, you need to screen. And again, aggressive hydration, allopurinol for prevention. Monitor the electrolytes very closely in these patients that are high risk for TLS. The next thing that can happen pretty fast on the floor is the delirium tremens, right? So progression timeline, you have 6 to 12 hours, it's a tremor, anxiety, and nausea. You have a patient who's has high risk, they have substance use disorder, or they don't tell you they have it, but they have high alcohol level when you came in. And then as the alcohol is washing out, a patient will start having the nurses call you, but the patient is acting weird, hallucinations, and then they start having seizures, right? This is this becomes a very, very rapidly, you know, developing condition. 48 to 72 hours, you can have the delirium tremens, which is 10 to 15% mortality with that. Make sure you have your CYR score to guide your benzodiazepine dosing, thymine to prevent wernickes. 
and uh, you can use phenobarbital for refractory cases related to use your liberal benzodiazepine dosing prevents that progression and don't under treat uh, the withdrawals. Acute hypoxemic respiratory failure signs you could see be called a lot of times patients with accessory muscle use, tripod positioning, physical breathing, a change in mentation. They can't speak in full sentences, fatigue. You can look at the ROX index predicting the HFNC failure. So you can look at the SpO2 divided by F FiO2 and divided by respiratory rate. And if it's less than 3.85 at the 12 hours, you know, these patients are high risk for intubation. This is a better kind of estimate of if you need to intubate. Now, the critical peril here is the early intubation is safer than emergent crash intubation. Of course, with those emergent intubations, you have your high risk for aspirating, your high risk for other mistakes that you can make while intubating these patients. So if you see all these warning signs, don't wait for a patient going on respiratory arrest. The next condition that one of them would be stroke, but remember a stroke, not only just the ischemic stroke, but the hemorrhagic stroke can happen on the floors. If the nurse calls you, hey, this patient is telling me that his right arm is weak or his speech is not coming out normal. The balance loss, they can't walk anymore. Yesterday, we were okay. Remember that those things can happen on the floor when the patient is in the hospitals for another reason. Early consults for TPA, thrombectomy, last known wells, very important. Immediate CT head to rule out hemorrhage, DKA or HHS. You have DKA with the NI and gap metabolic acidosis with ketones versus HHS, which is extremely high. Glucose level, hyperosmolarity with minimal ketones, but be careful with large amounts of insulin, which will drive the potassium intracellulary and be at risk of a cardiac arrest. You must maintain the K greater than 3.3 at least before starting insulin. A lot of guidelines even say greater than 5 before starting insulin drip. Just be aware of a chance of severe hypokalemia with high amounts of insulin. Monitor the potassiums and the BMP. Hypokalemia during insulin therapy actually kills more than glycemia. Two bag method a D10 plus NS prevents the hypoglycemia, will clear and help to clear the ketones. These are very highly tested topics on boards and they can happen in the hospital. The 4T score for thrombocytopenia that is greater than 50% drop. The timing five to 10 days after heparin exposure, thrombosis, or other circulate. I would say this could get you when a patient just recently got discharged from the hospital, now comes in with new thrombocytopenia. So I would be very, very aware of patients who are a readmission within the last few days or week or two. You can chance getting a thrombosis, start all heparin immediately, including the flushes, start alternative anticoagulation, including argotroban and fondoprinex. Now, a critical pair is avoid platelet transfusion in these cases. In fact, if you give platelets in these patients, you increase the risk of thrombosis. Hyperkalemia with ECG changes, very aware of changes in the EKG based on the amount of potassium. So 5.5 to 6.5 is where you usually see the peak T waves. Anything around 6.5, you start seeing widened QRS and prolonged PR intervals. And then anything around 7.5, you have a sine wave that can lead to VFib or asystole. The treatments stabilize the cardiac membrane, calcium first, shift the insulin plus dextrose. If you're worried about giving patients or non-diabetic insulin, put them on, give them extrose first and give them the insulin. Albuterol, remove the diuretics and you can use diuretics and use dialysis. So there are many ways, depending on how high the potassium is to deal with this hyperkalemia. But remember, don't wait for the labs. If ECG shows hyperkalemia changes, treat immediately especially if you feel like this patient could be at the high risk of hyperkalemia. 12 and 13 are endocrine emergencies, very commonly seen malignant hypercalcemia. You can see these in common malignancies like lung cancer, renal cell carcinoma, multiple myeloma. These patients present with stones, bones, grown psychiatric overtones. If the calcium is greater than 14, of course, you can have arrhythmias, renal failure, and confusion. Always we want aggressive hydration, calcitonin for rapid effect, and the bisphosphonates for sustained control, onset for two to four days. Make sure to treat the underlying malignancy to prevent the recurrence. Adrenal crisis, patients with the classic triad of hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypotension, refractory to your regular fluids. Think about and make sure you're asking about chronic steroid use, especially if they are now present with acute stressors such as post-surgery or infection. Abrupt steroid discontinuation, bilateral adrenal hemorrhage. Immediate management would be the hydrocortisone 100 Q8. Again, check your guidelines always. Aggressive fluid resuscitation with normal saline, correct the hypoglycemia. 
If present, don't wait for the cosentropin stimulation test results. And this is one of the cases where you can treat empirically, or we will call it TX before DX if clinical suspicion is high. And if you wait too long, this could be fatal. And now to the last two conditions, a bowel ischemia and rapid AFib in these two can kill your patient. Remember that, that pain out of proportion to exam is a hallmark. Lactate rising and continuing to rise. Patient with history of AFib uh, that's not controlled with RVR. Embolic mesenteric ischemia, pretty common, can happen. Uh, peritoneal signs or rigid uh, abdomen can develop uh, later. And uh, diagnostic approach, always the CTA uh, of the abdomen and pelvis with contrast. Free air under the diaphragm is already signs of perforation. And mesenteric ischemia can have the pneumatosis or thumb printing on an imaging. But this is a surgical emergency and early consultation to prevent the bowel necrosis and septic shock. Don't delay the imaging or surgery if there's a high likelihood that this patient can have a bowel ischemia. Now, rapid AFib with RVR. Hemodynamic consequences can have is actually dropping the cardiac output because you use that atrial kick and you can drop this cardiac output by 20-30%. Tachycardia reduces that diastolic feeling and if someone has already heart failure or already has ischemia or MI, this can precipitate that. So management is very important to rate control with deltides and metoprolol or other ways. Unstable, if possible, do the synchronized cardioversion and if the patient is hypotensive, avoid beta blockers, use other agents. And the critical pair here is to treat the underlying cause. Always remember that RVR usually has a precipitating cause. It could be sepsis, PE, or toxicosis. If the patient, and the thyroid toxicosis is one of those conditions that actually can get missed. And the patient's going to come in for AFib or RVR while, well, in fact, they're having thyroid toxicosis. The other way around can happen as well, myxedemia coma. And so be very aware of these endocrine emergencies. Just be aware as one of the signs of things you need to rule out address the trigger and not just the rhythm. Pattern recognition is very important. A universal principle for early detection, always be aware. The lab value context, the lactate, your troponins, your electrolytes, always use the clinical context and not in isolation. Something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't make sense. Trust your instincts. Time-sensitive protocols. Remember that for stroke with TPA antibiotics, a one-hour daughter balloon for STEMIs, 90 minute, right? So you want to have those time sensitive protocols in mind all the time. Key insight is that the early recognition beats the late intervention every time. Remember to escalate the care in the hospital. You have ICU transfer for patients with severe metabolic derangement, respiratory failure, hemodynamic instability, needing vasoactive medications. Early transfer is always better than waiting to deteriorate. Rapid response to be called anytime you are clinical instinct says that something is going on, the patient is bleeding too rapidly, heart rate is too high, SpO2 is dropped by 90, less than 90%, you know, if you are nurse or any provider concern, you should call the rapid response. Don't wait for deterioration. If you see that the SVP is dropping and you repeated it a couple of times and this is a real blood pressure drop like that, and with a map less than 65, 60, I would start thinking about calling a rapid response and getting an ICU or surgical consult if needed. A surgical consultation for acute abdomen signs, peritoneal signs, free air on an x-ray, bowel ischemia and perforation, necrotizing soft tissue infections, patients who've received a lot of fluids and now they're developing compartment syndrome. Uh, don't miss on those. So make sure you get the early consults. A patient with expanding hematoma, anemia, post-heart cath through the femoral. Be aware of these conditions that can kill your patient right away. I will upload the clinical toolkit, the PDF for you. This is just educational. Of course, it's not complete. It's missing a lot of treatments, but it's good to just have that in mind. Be on top of these 15 conditions that can kill your patient rapidly. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much for liking it and leaving me a comment. If you have any ideas for more videos in the future, please don't hesitate to drop a line for me. I'll see you guys on the next episode.